it's Tuesday, 12.30, and it's a beautiful day, and I hope it's a beautiful, fabulous day wherever you are in the world. And welcome to this week's edition of Mindset Michelle TV show. We're so pleased that you are joining us, whether you're in lockdown or out of lockdown, in winter or summer or spring or autumn. It is a fabulous day because we're alive, we're here, and in this moment, we want to celebrate everything that is about being alive. And in particular, we have an extra special guest this week. We have Tony Ryan, who's going to speak to us around education futurism. And now Tony has quite a fascinating background, having worked with students, teachers, schools, all of those elements around education for many, many years. And his latest book, The Next Generation, was recently released by Wiley and Sons Publishers. He has an incredible background in this space. And when we ask the questions about, well, what does the future hold? And how can we educate children? How can we prepare them for the future? How can we train their wonderful brains and give them the skills that they need to be the thought leaders of the future? So welcome, Tony. I'm so excited about having you on the show today and talking through these really interesting and valuable discussions. My honor, Michelle. Delighted to be with you. Fabulous. So I guess the starting point may be, what is an education futurist and how do you become one? You know, it, I don't, didn't see it on the, you know, job options at school around accounting or whatever. <laughs> how did you actually become an education futurist? Uh, Michelle, I, was, I was a former teacher. I love being a teacher. Uh, I then moved into this field. I'm an independent consultant. I basically support schools. I'm preparing for what's up ahead. So that's the short version of what I do. And so that teaching background, was it something that you, when you were in school, you were going, oh, gee, I'd love to be a teacher? Oh, certainly in uh, secondary school, I was really excited about that sort of thing. I had that in mind for a long time. I love helping kids. I mean, they are our future. So a yeah, very obvious point, and yet they are. You know, that's our future in 20 years from now. So we need to support them in terms of being capable adults who can then create a viable future for all of us. Fabulous. And, and is innovation one of those things that you yourself were interested in from a very early age? Uh, look, the education fascinates me for a start because it's, I think, the most important profession on the planet. Some would uh, consider that medicine is the most important one at the moment, and certainly it is. So education is going to be the profession that leads us into that post-pandemic future. So it's important. And I've always been fascinated by futurism anyway. You know, I love to think about what's coming up ahead and what could be, you know, in store for us. Mind you, you can't, pre you can't actually predict it. So be aware of anyone who ever says they can. They're the people who say they can tell you the gold lotto numbers for this Saturday night, which is basically impossible, just to let you know. However, we can prepare for it more capably than we might think. Uh, and that sort of thing fascinates me. So a futurist is not someone who predicts the future. It's someone who helps people develop scenarios and options of what might happen up ahead and then to prepare for those different options. And I think that now is, you know, such an important time. One of the things I'm aware of that with all of the news being around the pandemic and COVID, people have really stopped talking about the displacement coming from technology with AI and RPA and all of the different um, means of technology, there's going to be such a structural displacement in terms of jobs, jobs that will no longer exist and that people will need to retrain into what we're going to be working in in the future at a time when you actually don't know what that will look like or what skills that will need. But I, I love how you're explaining that because it's actually preparing with what you know about the future so you can set yourself up to succeed. Well, Michelle, when it comes to adults, let alone children, we focus in on a fancy word, and the word is capabilities. So a capability is something that makes you more capable of coping with whatever happens up ahead. So while skills are an important thing, and we'll keep you know, building them up as much as we can, it's capabilities that really matter. So obvious ones like literacy and numeracy come into it. They're also ones like adaptive agility, the ability to adjust to circumstances, and the ability to think effectively, which to me is one of the all-time most important ones of all. So that's one of the secrets and obvious ones on how you prepare children for the future. You help them to become more capable in key things. So, so 
I'd be interested in your opinion, Lynn, around, um, you know, Socrates and very much that philosophical way of teaching, especially at university level with children, was something that was um, encouraged and, and, you know, a very big part of universities a long time ago. And it's become so much more job focused now rather than thinking ability focused. Do you think that that's something that they've lost? Hmm. Interesting to conjecture on whether we lost it or not. I think it's been in hibernation perhaps for a while and we just get lambasted with, you know, so much news that's just information. We need to go to deeper levels in terms of this, in terms of wisdom. So the dynamic of Socrates, I love the concept of inquiry. Uh, one of my key points with children would be that we need to show them how to ask great questions. A lot of growing ups like teachers and parents keep thinking they need to ask good questions to the children so that they're then stimulated into thinking of things. The biggest thing of all is when children can ask insightful questions. So if you wanted a practical on that one, you go into some search engine, there's plenty of them, not just Google, and you put in some heading like Socratic thinking and you'll come up with all these cool question starters and then you can build them into discussion with them and then get them to ask them the quest, ask you the questions. That's the key, children asking great questions. And the fancy word is inquiry. We want children to be inquirers who are always inquiring and learning and discovering new things in their life. And that comes from a questioning mind. And that's also where in real innovation comes from. It, it's not accepting that things have been done the way that they're done for forever. And so you just keep doing it. it it's really questioning. And, and in business world, I always love the example that gets used around Henry Ford and the first car. If he, if he had have done what everybody wanted, which was get a faster horse, then his inquiring mind wouldn't have looked at other options, other solutions. And I definitely think with the climate challenge and other things that we're all facing now, it's really having that inquiring mind to look at the status quo and then go, well, what if? And, and I can think of politics in a number of different areas where, where that kind of inquiring mind would be really helpful to look at as a circuit breaker in terms of the current dynamics going on. And, you know, people are seeing this time as horrendous, and generally it is. So many people have been displaced by this, and, you know, millions of people have died, which is an absolute tragedy. In between all of that, there are tendrils and, you know, like seeds germinating that are going to challenge us to live a better society up ahead. Because when you think about your own life, you generally don't learn from when you do things well and you have success. You learn when you make mistakes and something goes badly wrong. And that's, I think, what is collectively happening on the planet right now. So I think we're going to see the next five years of the most amazing transition into a new way of living life on this planet. I, I agree. I mean, the working from home versus going back to the office versus the hybrid model in, in my world, that, that is one of the big debates and, and the, the waking up to the reality that people don't want to be in the office and, and what does that mean? And, you know, getting used to the idea that you may never meet work colleagues face-to-face -face ever. You know, all of these um, seeds, I think, were again planted prior to COVID, but you're right. COVID and, and the disruption that's happening at the moment are things that are accelerating a lot of those changes. And, and children, you know, who are suddenly being homeschooled and, and, you know, the advantage in some ways, yes, they're around their parents more than they may have been. And, of course, the disadvantages of all the stress that that can also create. But, you know, some, some of those memories that those children will have compared to other generations that didn't have that amount of time, family time even, going for walks at the beginning or the end of the day, all, all those small things that to children, you know, actually mean quite a lot. Absolutely. Fabulous. So one of the things I'm interested in is also, you know, what your definition of success is then, given that you've got a unique lens around futurism and education, and, and also what your idea of success then might be in terms of when we're looking at younger people and um what that might look like in terms of building success from an early age. You know, I don't think there's a simple formula for success. You know, I mean, what would that be anyway? You know, like I'm starting to watch the Paralympics and I'm thinking, what if someone who has spent, you know, 15 years getting to the stage where they can go to that event in Tokyo 
and they come last in their event. Do you call that success? Because I sure do. Or I know of a mother of a, a, a single mum of a nine-year-old disabled boy, and she's had no more than two hours sleep any night of his entire life. And uh, I think she's successful. Or what about parents who bring up three loving, beautiful kids? You know, what about someone who spent 25 years trying to put together the most amazing poem or piece of music? There are so many definitions of success. You know, people talk about money sometimes and say, if you earn a certain amount, then you're successful. Well, maybe. You know, I actually think it's to become a decent human being. So there's my, like, you know, quick interpretation on success, to become an amazing human being who supports others and themselves. And uh, perhaps you realise there are only two groups of people on the planet. The two groups are you and everyone else. And you need to find that favourable balance between them. And in fact, I reckon a 50-50 would just about the optimum in terms of success. And a lot of people mess up that balance because they're sometimes perhaps 90% themselves and only 10% others. And as far as I'm concerned, they're a selfish individual who's taking up too much space on the planet because part of your scene is <laughs> contributing to others before you die. The trouble is that too many people also go 10-90 and they don't look after themselves and they only help other people all the time. And I mean, that's beautiful for a while until they finally burn out and then they can't help those other people anyway. So we need to have a deep belief in self, a sense of you know, self-reflection and self-mastery, and at the same time, then contribute to others all the time before we die. So there's the fable 50-50 balance. And I think that's critical when it comes to success. So when you want to start talking about children and how they can be successful, are we talking like right now or are we talking you know, in 35 years' time? Because too often in like a lot of Western societies, we te tend to think in terms of a day or a year away, whereas other cultures can think a generation away. And can I hint that both are, you know, have a lot of merit? We need to think ahead. So if a parent is listening to this right now and you have children and they're perhaps eight years old, I want you to think of who they will be when they're 28 or 38 years old and to backward map to now and start to steadily give them support so that they can actually happen, that they can become an amazing person, whatever that is. Now, there are, I have many more responses to you know, what success can mean. Uh, though it depends on the sort of questions you'd love to ask, because if you want to go a little edgy, we can talk the extraordinary possibility of what humanity really could be. So you might, for example, explore the Savant syndrome, around 100 recorded cases in the past century of people who have an IQ between 40 and 65 and yet they have one prodigious gift that is just simply amazing, generally in either maths or music, though it can happen in other fields as well. And what they can do is beyond comprehension. So you might think of that old movie Rain Man, you know, where this guy could multiply the most astonishing numbers together in his head. In fact, five-digit numbers. He was a real-life character. So I've researched it. So if you want to get into the Savant syndrome, you could. Or you can talk the concept of the flow state in psychology. There are eight key conditions. And it's in, when you're in a, an autotelic experience, which means you lose track of time. Nearly everyone can tell me of a time in their lives when they experience that. I've had a few, and they are just extraordinary times. If they might last for 10 seconds or 10 minutes or maybe 10 hours, and it's where you are totally in flow. So, you know, if you want to talk success, where do you want to start? There are so many dimensions to it. <laughs> Well, so much to unpack there and, and thank you because I think that that's one of the most comprehensive answers I've had for that question so far. And, and I love it because it, it gives so many different concepts and ideas and I'm sure there'll be people that will actually look up some of them. But to, to look at it firstly around the 50-50 the, you know, balance between giving and receiving and, and um, I think that that is quite important. And as you were saying about you know, parents looking at their children and, you know, if that child, as they are now at six, seven, eight, whatever age they are, thinking about that child as an adult and, you know, have they learnt the good skills about giving and receiving? I, I do believe it's an important cycle, giving to yourself, giving to others, receiving from self, receiving from others. And that life journey, if you like, is working on that balance because sometimes you get it right and sometimes you don't. But That's it's a right. continuous journey towards learning how to take care of yourself, learning how to take care of others. And when you're out of balance, I completely agree, is when that 50-50 is out of balance and you're either giving too much or receiving too much and you, you're actually looking for ways to come back into that balance. Now, some of what you were talking around the... Um, 
the Sabanic um, approach and other approaches getting into the flow. I think that those are also really great ideas and tools and concepts that again, parents can use when looking at their children and helping their children to identify the, essentially their gifts. What is it that their gift is in this lifetime and how can they express that in the best way? And, and for me, it also comes back to that not comparing them to or comparing yourself to somebody else, which I think is probably one of the key things. And, and when I ask people later in the show, you know, what's one thing you regret or this or that, it's about that being true to yourself. So I do agree that the more parents can actually instill that being true to yourself in their children and, and understanding that it's not being out of balance, but going on that journey of balance. And I think that these are all great things to actually call in that um, overall word of success and, and living a successful life. So if we move on then to post-pandemic, but the pandemic's just another, um, you know, another moment in time in some ways where society, cultures, parents are having a hard time and what do you think would be some of the keys to building a successful mindset as the parents are looking at HSC students who would be you know we're back at school we're not back at school we're this we're that and other children that they're, they're helping to navigate through the challenges that they've currently got but also aware that how they um, help their children and help young people is how they then set them up with the skill set, with the mindset for going forward in their lives. What sort of tips would you give there? Oh, boy. The $64 million oh boy. question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, can like, we bottle it? <laughs> I, I'm not sure I can give some glib, you know, simplistic answer to that one. Uh, you know, something along the lines of our, our mindsets generally, I think collectively on the planet at the moment, we're slipping a little bit and maybe a big bit, especially with some people. So perhaps one of my bits of uh, so-called advice would be, in spite of everything going on, to look for the good at least now and again. And within that, to be grateful for what is going well. So for example, if you are sort of sitting and listening to this, it means you're alive, your heart is beating and you're breathing. That's a good start to the day. And I'm not being glib about that one at all. I'm actually saying be grateful for what you do have and look for the good. You know, like so much uh, negative portrayal is offered by the media on what's happening at the moment. And I'm not necessarily knocking the media. They tend to just do that. And there's a lot of good people working in it. They're just working too hard, probably. We need to also look for the good on what is going on. And we need to reframe what is happening. And we need to do this with children as well. So you need to help them to research good stories of things that are happening around the planet right at this moment. You know, there are tens of hundreds of millions of people who are giving support in all sorts of amazing ways to others who are less fortunate. We need to record those stories and share them with others and in their own lives to look for the good as much as possible. So to do that at least occasionally is a really, really important point because, you see, we all fit on a line to some degree in terms of our thinking. It's a continuum from being very negative and vindictive to being very positive and optimistic. And generally, you fit in about a quarter of that in a lot of your life. So I think at the moment, there's a bit of a slide going downhill. Now, you need to be careful about extremes on each end. So to be really pessimistic or really optimistic, neither is a good thing. Being pessimistic means you're going to die younger on average. Now, <laughs> being, being too optimistic means you believe everything you hear. So if you get some you know, email from someone in a, a, a country saying that your great rich uncle just died, and if you just send your bank account details, you'll get, end up with millions of dollars. And you go, wow, what an amazing opportunity. Life just grants me all these miracles. And, you know, then you get caught up in it. So you need to be at the 90% point on the line. And that's where I want children to be as well. So be a little bit aware of things out there, but still look for the good whenever you possibly can. And even right now, I mean, I'm a germ freak. I've been pushing buttons with my elbow for the last 20 years. So, you know, I can't see all bad in all of this. And am I being facetious here? Not really. Have a look at the dramatic transformation in the medical like technology in the past 12 months, you know, with the creation of the, the vaccines, which predominantly are probably going to rescue us. The genius minds who've created those, you know, are people really thinking about this? Look for the good that's going on in spite of all the lousy things as well. 
So that's a big message, I think, for children and growing ups, okay, to see the best in things as much as possible. And I know it sounds a bit mumbo jumbo, 1990s, new age thinking. We need to get over that, though. We need to goimo. If you haven't heard of goimo before, G-O-I-M-O, it stands for get over it, move on. So we need to actually goimo in terms of having all the negative messages, which actually feed parts of our brain that, strangely enough, love those negative messages. So in terms of this with children, if you're a grown up who's working with children, you've got to model what it means to be a great adult. And that means you don't sit and watch the news all day and watch the rerun on the 11 a.m. interview with the Premier talking about how things are getting worse all the time because these kids are watching you thinking, oh, is that what it means to live an inspiring adult life? You know, you need to show them what it means to be a responsible, determined human being who's going to make great things happen because that's one of the critical points in terms of children becoming very good at what they do. And further, if we're talking success with children, Michelle, again, we're talking those capabilities. We're talking steadily chipping away, building them up in children. So one capability is resilience. It's the thickness of your skin. It's your capacity to cope with difficult things in life. And please keep in mind, anyone listening to this, that we're all different. There's no one rule that fits for all. Success doesn't mean the same thing for everyone. It's different for everyone. And resilience is the same. So for example, with some children, they're hugely resilient and they're going to get through this. They just go, yeah, it's cool. I'll get on. And they will. And then others could be really struggling with it. They're looking for the worst excesses all the time and magnifying them inside their own head. So one thing we really do is in terms of resilience and every other one of those capabilities, we show them how to think. So a fancy word that we need to use a lot is metacognition. It means you think about your own thinking. So if you're listening to this right now, I might say to you, well, what's happening inside your head right now? What are you thinking about? Now, I don't want to know. I don't want to impose on your privacy. Though we'll call I'm... this number now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I bet I'd hear some interesting answers. It's, it's more or less an awareness. It's a wake-up call to it. So where am I? Okay, here's Cookie. Here's probably the most practical idea I can give to you in terms of how to help children to think and become decent human beings, fully aware of their own thinking. Cookie is a finger puppet because I'm into kookaburras. I just love them. You know, they're like gutsy birds. Anyway, this is my, my finger puppet called Cookie. And what I do is this. I might just write some words on a screen or a piece of paper like this day is fantastic. And then I get children to say those words in their head at normal speaking speed without moving their lips and no sound. So they just sit there and they think the words in their head. So they're aware they can say them in their head. Then I'll introduce them to Cookie. And there's usually a couple of stages. The first one is when they talk aloud to Cookie. So they go, hey, Cookie, how am I going to solve this issue with my sister? She's a pain in the neck. Then they get Cookie to talk back to them. So they pretend to be a ventriloquist. And so Cookie goes, okay, well, what options have you got? You could talk with your parents or you could sit with a piece of paper and write down five ideas. So they learn how to have an open conversation with this Cookie. The next step after a few days or a few weeks is that they think to it and Cookie thinks back. So you'll see this 12-year-old looking at this thing and they're looking intently and then it starts vibrating because it's thinking back to them. So bear with me here. I know it sounds absolutely ridiculous. And then the third step is when they get rid of Cookie and by then they've learned how to have the conversation inside their own minds. Very few primary children can do that without being shown. Only some secondaries do it and not enough adults do it. Too many adults just fall off the deep end when something goes wrong in their lives without thinking, hold on, what can I do about this? It's almost as though you have a second person with you. And if you want to talk success, I think generally the most successful people are the ones who have their meta self as a master coach, as a mentor who's guiding and supporting them, and they can have the conversation with them. And that, by the way, is uh, steeped in uh, a lot of ancient uh, cultures in terms of their religions, where they talk about the angel or guide or the seer who is over your shoulder. I'm just bringing it into the modern world. We need to show children how to do this. It's a critical point in terms of their success in life to become aware of themselves because then when they're doing something like learning something new, they can go, hold on, what's a more effective way of doing this? Rather than just accepting it and being told what to do by someone without thinking about it themselves. There's a few thoughts on that. Wow, and amazing. And again, I, I, I can't thank you enough for this, this depth of wisdom that you're sharing and, and even then in that very accelerated but wonderful way that you explained about um, the voices in your head and, and self-talk is how, how we would talk about it or I would talk about it. 
and learning about that self-talk and, and very beautifully showing how you can teach your own children about self-talk. You were using the kookaburra, but you could actually use their favourite toy or anything around the That's house right. to yep. actually teach those skills. And you could also role model it to your children so that they can see, um, you know, going back to some of the earlier points you were making around gratitude and resilience, which are really very, very important for modelling to children, but also helping them to learn how to do it for themselves. And that technique that you were showing of, of self-talk is just fabulous because if you get up and, and you hear, you know, Kookaburra saying, oh, it's a terrible day, the sun's not shining, you can then say to Kookaburra, well, you know, well, what is good in the day? And, and the Kookaburra can say, well, you know, we've got a roof over our head and we've got food on the table and stuff like that. Or, you know, my, my best friend's, you know, going to play on Zoom with me later today. So all of that resilience and gratitude and using these fabulous skill sets to help the adults, but also help the adults role model it for their children and for young people. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Now, Michelle, there's a bit of an addendum to that one. It's a tricky sort of one. I'm not into the positive thinking movement. No, no, this isn't about positive thinking. No, this is, exactly. Yeah. It's but about for me, being, I, I actually yeah. describe it as positive focus. Okay, it's been a positive. Point. Positive thinking, mate, in the way I've experienced it, is it kind of denies that you're going to have negative thinking, whereas positive focus is exactly like you were describing in your 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 um, chain. Instead of being 90 and 10 percent or 10 and 90, you actually want to see where you are, acknowledge that you have these negative thoughts and emotions and feelings, but then come back to a positive focus. So yes, I feel sad that I can't go outside to play with my friend. But I'm actually really grateful that we have the technology here in Australia that I can still see them and play on, oh, on Zoom. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm not even into the whole happiness thing. You know, I hear a lot of parents saying, I just want my children to be happy. Well, in fact, I think happiness is a very shallow construct. Uh, happiness is just a fleeting emotion. What we need to be in is deep engagement. We need to be fully immersed in everything we do in life, be totally present with whatever we're doing this conversation or eating a lunch or talking with other good friends we need to be there with it in all of its glories and difficulties so it's not about happiness it's about deep experience and it's giving everything to what you do because i mean one day we're all going to resign retire or die hopefully not on the same day and we <laughs> and we better hope we better hope that someone stands up and gives some sort of eulogy or thanks you know thank you speech that says something like this person gave everything to life they fully contributed they had great energy for everything they did they were basically present that's what you need said exactly I, I couldn't agree more and unfortunately we're coming to the end of time now and i know that there'll be a lot of people watching that really have loved some of the gems that you've shared today. So how can they get hold of you after the show today? TonyRyan.com.au. Or they okay. could go, if they want a whole lot of ideas in terms of teaching children to think, I've got plenty at thinkerskeys.com. Uh, so I've got a blog there where I focus on beautiful ideas around the planet. And I've got just hundreds of great ideas on generating good thinking in children. So there are a couple of places they can find me. Wonderful. And, and if you were to give one thing or one bit of advice to your younger self, um, and I can see that I have now frozen, what would that young bit of advice be? <laughs> Always hold on to hope. You know, the psychology is really strong on it. It's the most important four-letter word. Look for hope in things. Do whatever you can to see, you know, the, the optimistic, the positive in terms of what you can do. And given that, you believe in yourself at the deepest, deepest level. In spite of feeling uncertain about being able to do different things, just give it a go. Give it everything. Have hope for what is up ahead. Because as we're wrapping up, Michelle, if we all lose that sense of hope collectively on the planet, we're in licorice all sorts. We really are. We're in deep trouble because if, you know, seven and a half billion people think the world's going to be awful up ahead, it probably will be. It's called the Pygmalion effect, the self-fulfilling prophecy. Mind you, if everyone wakes up tomorrow morning and says, we could make this the most amazing time in human history as we come out of this pandemic, it probably will be. So we need to have that hope of being able to make that happen. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and in talking about parents and what they can give to their children, I think that giving them hope 
and modeling that hope is something that, you know, is, is priceless in terms of preparing them for the future and preparing, like you're saying, the planet for the future. So Tony Ryan, what an absolute pleasure and such a gift. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, it is my honor, Michelle. Thank you. And for everybody watching, wow, um, yet another amazing lens at looking at creating a successful mindset and, and especially looking at it in terms of children and young people around you and what you can do for yourself, for them, in building that positive focus and that positive direction for your mindset to create a better world for everybody. But for now, for this week, this, we've come to the end of time. So from my heart to your heart, be great, be fabulous, and be you.